Hello and welcome to today's session. We are today looking at one of the 17th century works titled Orunoko, which also has an alternate title or the Royal Slave, written by Afrobain. Orunoko is considered as a short work of prose fiction, more like a proto novel type. This was published in 1688 towards the end of the 17th century. This work has an eponymous hero, an African prince from Coromantian who is tricked into slavery and then sold to British colonists in Suriname. And it's there, as for the text, it's there in Suriname that he meets the narrator, the narrator who happens to be the author, Afra Ben. And this work is considered as extremely important in the history of English language and literature. Though this is a 17th century text, we find a lot of critique of colonialism in this. We know that as far as Britain is concerned, uh, Britain had reached the zenith of its colonial glory uh, from, the, from the end of the 16th century onwards. And we find that there, is a, there are a lot of ways in which the spirit of colonialism is celebrated in a number of English texts. But, but contrary to those texts, Orunoko is one text that too written by a female author where a strong critique of colonialism can be found, where a strong current against the value system and against the social uh, fabric of England uh, can, can be found there. Orunoko, this uh, proto-novel is a first person account of Orunoko's life, love, rebellion and execution and this is also considered as one of the earlier novels, though the form per se may look a little different when we look at it from the contemporary. Afra Ben is a first known professional female writer who lived from 1640 to 1689. The dates, we do not have too many uh, certain details about her date of birth or the other personal details. It's all by way of conjecture that some dates have been uh, found by historians. She lived during the restoration period and during that period she wrote dramas and prose fiction extensively and if you are familiar with the history of English. Uh, uh, literature. You also know that the, during the restoration period, plays were extremely popular. It was one of the easiest means to get livelihood as far as writers and artists were concerned. And the restoration period happens after a 40 year break in English history where theatre was shut down, where there were no forms of entertainment. That was the Puritan rule. And uh, it's during this time, during this restoration phase, that Afra Ben uh, gains significance and visibility. She could be considered as a playwright, a poet, translator and an essayist all turned uh, all, uh, all found in one. Uh, it's interesting that she turned to prose writing when revenue from the theatre diminished and uh, she also had uh, started her career as a dramatist in the first place because she was not really being uh, taken care of well by the state in spite of being a spy for Charles II's government. So it's a very, very interesting trajectory that we find in her career, in her life, given that she was a woman who was leading a life in the 17th century. In the 1660s, there's enough evidence to show that she worked as a she spy for Charles II's government in Antwerp and Suriname, uh, the historians suspect, but very little is known, but very little is known with certainty about her life. There is also enough evidence to show that she was married to a Dutch man for a while who also is uh, uh, supposed to have uh, died during one of the plagues. But we find her leaving, uh, but we find her leading an extremely individualistic life, a uh, very successful uh, life given that the society of those times was more, given that the society of those times was uh, more male centric and there was hardly any place for women in those public spaces whether it is be anything related to art or whether it is related to war and spy work and we find it is in such a male centric society that Afra Ben manages to carve out a space for herself. In July 1666 it is said that during the Anglo-Dutch war, she was sent to Antwerp in Belgium as an intelligence agent and she was, uh, she had to stay there. She was required to stay there till the end of the year, till December. And 
Asriya was a code name that she used as an agent and it is very interesting to read about these accounts and to know what a fascinating life she led in the 17th century and how different her articulations were as an artist. But however, in spite of this in, uh, um, incredible, spectacular, very different kind of work that she undertook, she was left to fend for herself. And uh, this, in fact, was the fate of many other agents of Charles II. If you know your English history, you would also know that it was a turbulent, a very interesting period in English history where we also find the equation between the parliament and the uh, crown, the parliament and the monarch radically changing and a lot of political changes coming into being, totally redefining and reshaping the way in which British history gets to be uh, shaped. And uh, during this period, once she returns from Antwerp, uh, it's also significant to note that she gets imprisoned for debt. She hardly gets paid for any of the work that she did, like many other agents. And it is said that some uh, uh, member from the uh, royalty, from the royal council, she they tried to rescue her out of the debt and she's out of imprisonment. But however, then she turns to writing as a means of earning a living and she therefore is now considered as the first female writer who, who, who could uh, uh, make a career out of writing. And this is extremely significant that she was not writing as a means of uh, self-expression. She was not writing as uh, uh, to, in order to offer a counter narrative in the male centric society. She was writing as a professional and that makes it all the more different. That makes it uh, that makes Orunoko a uh, special work to talk about in the context of world literature that it marked the beginning of a uh, woman's professional journey as a writer. And it's in this context that we shall be looking at Orunoko and evaluating its historical significance not just in England but also in the larger context of world literature, in the context of the traditions that writers both male and female had uh, set in place. If we take a look at Bynes' writings, she wrote prolifically. She wrote, uh, it said that she wrote 15 plays or even more. There is no exact number which is available because some of the works which does not bear her name are also attributed to her. And most of her plays were very, very successful. And if you are familiar with the scene of restoration drama, it was mostly restoration comedy, that to uh, the uh, body kind of comedy that Charles II's courtiers preferred. It's in such a setting and that is in, it, it's from such a social context that Ben emerges as a very different kind of an artist doing, practicing the kind of politics that she believed in and manifesting that in her writings in a very powerful way. And uh, her uh, plays were also noted for the performance by well-known and talented actors of the time, Anthony Lay, James Noakes, uh, Charles Hart, Elizabeth Barry, and and uh, Brace Girdle were some of the famous writers of those, were some of the famous actors of those times who also acted in most of uh, Bain's uh, plays that also added to the uh, appeal uh, of her works being uh, staged. During a time when most writers were trying to avoid getting into any kind of political trouble, who were trying to stay away from the center of political affairs, we find uh, Bain taking the lead and she is not holding back anything while she's doing her satire. The round heads are the good old causes. One of the satires targeting uh, the king's wig opponents. And it's important to note that during the restoration time, the writers led a very precarious life. If they ran into any trouble with the, uh, with the rulers of those times, if they had any political controversy brewing about their careers or about their lives, they could it, it could uh, ruin their career and even their life. And uh, so we find most of them staying away from any serious matters and just focusing on some mindless comedy, mostly focusing on uh, a man-woman relationship and, uh, and trying to make it as body as possible. Uh, if, we, if you uh, recall the way uh, Hudson uh, Henry Hudson talks about English, the history of English uh, language and literature. When he talks about this section on restoration comedy, he makes this point that it is not even worth our time to spend time 
discussing the restoration drama because it is not worth of uh, it's not really worth it at all. We find uh, Afro Bain emerging as a very different kind of a, an artist during this time with conviction and with some kind of a uh, powerful stance that is hard to that is hard not to notice in most of our works. So Bain also did face this threat of falling into financial hardship if she did not toe the line, if she did not uh, always manage to please the ones who were supposed to be uh, pleased. So we find her uh, however leading a tough life because she had offered unswerving loyalty to two Stuart kings but still her safety is not assured. In fact, uh, even after having got the huge appreciation from King Charles for being a spy and an excellent one at that in Antwerp and uh, possibly in Suriname. We find her getting imprisoned for satire against the Duke of Monmouth who was also King Charles II's uh, illegitimate son. So as you know King uh, Charles II's court was uh, well known for the kind of promiscuous activities that the king himself was indulging in and it was being seen as the most in vogue thing to do then. And he also had a lot of illegitimate children and we know the kind of politics and the kind of uh, uh, political drama which was happening at the background. So uh, we find Bain taking a stance when she's trying to write about these things and expose these things before the public. We find her coming across as a very fearless woman. She died on April 16, 1689 and uh, her active literary career was uh, for just about 20 years, in fact less than 20 years. So in this period, it is, if we take an inventory of her work, it's about 17 dramas. Uh, she launched her career with uh, dramas because uh, dramas were financially more rewarding during the period and uh, she also earns this title of being a professional. She wrote a number of lyric poems and there are 14 titles in prose fiction and a handful of translations as well. She was a very well-read woman who could write prolifically and also bring together a range of artistic skills and present them in an effective way. Orunoko, this fiction, Orunoko is set in Suriname and Suriname was a British colony. It was soon to fall to the Dutch. Um, unlike the many other colonies that Britain had then, um, Suriname was far away from London and hence it was disordered and mismanaged. This is an information which is handy to keep in mind which will be useful when we took, uh, take a closer look at the text uh, later. And the narrator of this uh, novel is usually identified with the author Afra Bain. Uh, the narrator writes as a colonist and at the same time the narrator has admiration and compassion for the royal slave Orunoko. So that is the premise and that is what defines the overall framework of the work as well. And talking about uh, slavery and colonialism in the 17th century, the English did not always consider Africans as natural slaves and this is something again to be kept at the back of our mind when we start uh, reading and analyzing the text of Orinoco. Orinoco was first published in 1688. It is a story of a heroic African prince and he dies in an attempt to free himself and others from slavery. So more than the framework more than the outline of this uh, uh, novel what is more interesting are the details that go into this and the perspectives that come across as being very very fresh and uh, we before we take a detailed look at this story we take a look at some of the significant aspects of this work which make it significant in the context of literary tradition and literary history. Orunoko may not come across as a well-formed round work of fiction when we look at it today. But this work was very significant in the development of the novel for its narrator persona and also for its use of concrete details to enhance realism. It is important to keep in mind that Afro Bain is writing Orunoko at a time when realism had not begun to be talked about as a prominent trend or realism had not begun to be identified as one of the most useful narrative uh, forms and it is during this time that this novel presents the narration in a very realist form and at the outset of the novel as we will uh, see in one of the later sessions when we take a look at the novel, there is an effort being made from the author to present the narrator and also to show that this is an authentic uh, kind of uh, narration. 
and this effort that Afrobain as a as an author and as the narrator of the story takes is very very important because the aspect of realism brings the satire hard hitting back home and uh, there is also an assurance that we get from the narrator at the beginning of the story that all the account is true there is no reason to suspect that this is uh, there is no reason to suspect whether some of the account, accounts are falsified or not and there is an attempt a very strong attempt made at the beginning to uh, convince the reader that this is true and thinking about the veracity of the accounts given that uh, Afrobain had spent some time in Suriname working as a spy we also begin to wonder whether some of the details are from her own life whether she herself had witnessed some of the details that she talks about in this work and this makes it significantly uh, different for many reasons because uh, men were seen as the ones experiencing adventure men were seen as the ones who travel to different places and bring back their experience and articulate in artistic forms publish and circulate in book forms here we find a woman who is not writing about the inside but on the other hand she's talking about the outside to which very few women have access to she's talking about that world outside which is predominantly male centric which is otherwise not accessible for a lot of women like her but for whatsoever reason the access that she finds the experiences that she has in that big bad world out there she successfully translates it into fiction and uh, what is interesting about this narration is also that when we look at the narrator when we look at the tone the details and the register that the narrator uses one does not feel that gender plays a significant role we find that she is able to narrate this experience with as much authenticity as many other male travelers and male uh, travelogue writers and male adventurers of those times had uh, possessed and looking at some of the thematic elements also makes this text stand out um, in Orunoko we find Afrobin's politics at work in the most visible way and in this she underscores the right of women to select their spouses and this goes very much against the value system the societal constraints of the 17th century England where women were still considered as a property of men decisions were always made for them and women were not really allowed to act as agents the agency was totally denied to them in in, in various ways in terms of education in terms of uh, career choices in terms of uh, uh, choosing a partner in terms of even having the rights over one's own body so she underscores in this uh, novel Orunoko we find Afrobin underscoring the right of women to select their spouse she also makes her opposition to slavery known very very evident and during a time when it is seen as the most natural thing to employ slaves to get their work done and this we find as a trend being very prominent across the various nations who are in who are uh, in the rat race for colonies in Europe and Bain in fact takes a very prominent a very controversial kind of a political stance when she is articulating her opposition to slavery she also condemns the slave trade which was seen as the most one of the most profitable ways in which colonialism could grow it's also seen as one of the ways in which uh, it's also seen as one of the ways through which the colonies get to prosper the colonies get to benefit from the colonial uh, advancements so what uh, uh, Afrobain is doing is calling a spade a spade by saying that regardless of the kind of revenue that is getting generated through these colonial practices it is very very important and ethical also to articulate and to put on record the opposition to slavery and also a condemnation of the slave trade and as we know one of the earliest impetus as far as the colonial ambitions were concerned it was a white man's burden the white man 
whether the English man or the European man, it was considered that it was their responsibility to go out into the wild, into the uncivilized and to make them more civilized and more respectable and to give them the religion, the education, the civilization, the advancements and the foundations that the Western world had benefited from. So, the underlying assumption was that the primitive had to be rescued and to be brought into civilization, which by extension obviously meant the Western civilization. We find Afrabin very strongly critiquing that and we know that it is uh, pretty much a commonsensical kind of a thing in the post-orientalist, in the post-colonial world. But for someone to think like this in the 17th century, that was remarkable, it was very incredible. And when you took a, take a look at the story in detail, you will also realize that there was a celebration of the primitive and there is no hierarchical way in which she privileges the Western civilization, she privileges the Western system of education or the Western value system over the primitive. On the other hand, she finds in the primitive something to be celebrated, something to be appreciated and acknowledged. So, in Orinoco, we have an account of a hero who up upholds the ideals of civilization among Europeans who are the most part evil. And this is an important point that we, uh, and this is an important point to pay attention to as we wrap up our today's discussion. Orinoco as a novel stands out today as a 17th century text for various reasons. One, it is written by the first professional uh, female writer. And secondly, this is about a protagonist who is allowed to uphold the ideals of civilization. I repeat this, to uphold the ideals of civilization among Europeans who are for the most part evil. And this is certainly a very controversial thing and of course a very bold thing to say in the 17th century. And by the 19th century, late 19th and the early 20th century, we know that similar articulations are there in the public space. There are a lot of political thinkers and philosophers talking about it. There are statesmen debating these in different ways. But in the 17th century, when England is still proud of its status as the empire on which the sun never sets, we find Orinoco making a statement by arguing that, but by putting forth the idea that the ideals upheld by the Europeans may not always be the right ones. Maybe there's another way to look at the colonial practice. Maybe there's another way to look at the hierarchy which is in place which colonialism also brings in and this is something which predates the many discourses on colonialism. And to my mind the significance of Orunoko also rests mostly in this that it had the potential to talk about many things before time and also place it within a context even before the time had really arrived for it. So in the following section, we shall try to take a look at some of the excerpts from Orunoko and we also will try to show how this text stands out as a classic in world literature and how it helped redefine the paradigms within which colonialism and civilization and the clash between the, the primitive and the Western, the primitive and the sophisticated were understood in the 17th century. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.